I'm Bert Lancaster. I'm at the Museum of the Soviet Armed Forces in Moscow. This log hut was one of many built and occupied by Russian partisans during the unknown war on the Eastern Front. The secret deadly operations carried on behind Nazi lines by these civilians is a story that should be told. When Napoleon invaded Russia in 1812, he captured Moscow. But Russia's men and women, banding together behind his lines, turned the French invaders' lives into a living hell. The same thing happened in 1941, when Hitler's legions smashed into the Soviet Union. Vast areas of Russian land fell into their hands. But like mushrooms after a rain, a people's underground sprang up to harass, to attack Nazi formations, to blow up their ammunition dumps, to wreck their trains. The partisans operated everywhere, in the deep forest and marshes of Belorussia, in Odessa, where they set up an underground command post in the city's catacombs. On the shores of the Black Sea, a group of young people carried out operations against the Nazi invaders until the last member of the partisan band had been captured or shot. Nowhere were the Germans safe from the attacks of the Soviet partisans. The Russians called these underground soldiers the People's Avengers, and thousands of them paid for their heroism with their lives. Our story, Partisans, the Guerrilla War. Fighting back, the Red Army in the summer of 1941 was reeling from a massive surprise attack. All along Russia's European frontier, the Nazi horde was flooding its way deep into the plains. fastest, most merciless assault ever launched. It swept through the farms of the Ukraine and Belarusia, heading for Kiev, Smolensk, Leningrad, Moscow, intending the utter extinction of the Soviet state and the Russian people. That was Hitler's plan. Hermann Goering announced, this year in Russia, around 20 to 30 million people will die from starvation. The population of some nationalities have to be reduced. The Germans moved in as if taking over their birthright. They were kind to animals for the benefit of the newsreels to be shown back home though sometimes it was difficult to find any animals to befriend. For any civilians who survived the fighting and the execution squads that followed, there would be two possibilities in the event of a German victory. They would be herded to Siberia, or if they seemed Nordic enough, they would be absorbed into Germany. Their land and their goods would belong to the Thousand Year Reich. It was called the New Order. Hitler thought the Russian people had no choice but to accept it. was a choice, a grim and dangerous choice, and many took it. The partisan movement was born. Stubborn 
outraged, driven by love of country and home, the streams coalesced into a flood of resistance. soldiers of the Red Army and party members who had escaped the encirclement. They knew their struggle would be long and deadly. The Germans had made it a war of extermination against the partisans. The first partisan martyr, Zoya Kosmodemianskaya, was an 18-year-old girl. In the fall of 1941, Zoya operated behind the German lines during the Battle of Moscow. The Nazis caught her and hanged her in the village square. She was awarded the Order of Hero of the Soviet Union. Winter, the partisans have become a formidable organized force. Where there was a will, there was a way. Ill-equipped at the beginning, the partisans often armed themselves by a simple expedient. They captured weapons from the enemy. The knife, the grenade. The rifle were their tools. Machine guns were at a premium. Modern artillery a dream. Their main strength was their absolute commitment. They made an oath. Я гражданин великого Советского Союза. Верный сын героического русского народа, клянусь, что не выпущу... As a citizen of the great Soviet Union and loyal son of the heroic Russian people, I solemnly swear not to lay down my gun until the last fascist pig on our land is destroyed. За смерть детей наших, за пытки, насилие и издевательства над моим народом, я клянусь мстить жестоко. For the burned towns and cities, for the death of our children, for the torture, the violence and humiliation to which my people have been subjected, I swear to retaliate ruthlessly and tirelessly, blood for blood, death for death. Some of the partisan bands won national fame for their daring and effectiveness. One group called the Young Guard operated in the city of Krasnodom. They became folk heroes. In the end, the Nazis caught them, tortured them, and finally executed them. had no mines, hardly any explosives, but they did what they could.
partisan commanders were called Batka, father. This is Mine Batka. Minai Batka's real name was Shmirov. The Germans had burned his home. They shot his children as hostages. His daughter Liza, his sons, Seryosha and Duna, and the two-year-old Misha. Minai Batka was a name the Germans learned to fear. join the partisans en masse. These are the Ignatovs. Father commands. Mother Yelena is the head nurse. Yevgeny and Gennady, their two sons, were miners. On one mission, they blew up a German supply train. Both became heroes of the Soviet Union, posthumously. From then on, this partisan unit was known as the Yevgeny Gennady Group. The Unknown War will continue in a moment. The Partisans. The Soviet press never revealed the Partisans real name. This is Grandpa. Grandpa only went public when the war was over. He was one of the most famous commanders. His real name was Kovpa, and he had been mayor of the little town of Putivo in the Ukraine before the war. Partisan groups came together to exchange information and coordinate plans. Steadily, their movement grew in size, power, and effectiveness. The forests were their preserve. The Germans dared not enter, except in great force. Confident the Germans had not prepared properly for winter. Even less had they expected such savage hidden enemies behind their lines. All along their supply lines, the Germans dug in. No Nazi was safe. The night belonged absolutely to the partisans. By day, they made sudden, devastating raids. And then they vanished. In 30 below zero cold, the partisan bands roamed to Belarusia and the Ukraine. At first, hundreds of them. Then, thousands. As the war went on, the partisans were more and more able to work directly with units of the Red Army. They went out on reconnaissance patrols. And acquired information from German soldiers, dead or alive. in the partisan war. It isn't easy to fire a captured gun when the breech blocks have been removed. German prisoners were not reluctant to talk freely. They were terrified, fearing punishment for their own excesses. By the second year of the war, the partisan intelligence network had become very large and efficient and a boom to the Red Army. How many partisans were killed? 
Certainly there were very many of them among the 20 million Russian people who died in the unknown war. and Maria Sukhova. Maria was killed during a partisan attack. This is Maria's last film. was basic. Clothing, shoes, food were almost non-existent. Hunger and cold were their constant companions. In better times, many of them had been city dwellers. In the wilderness, cut off from all the convenience they had known, they had to learn a wholly new life. A life without ease. Shift hospital had no medical supplies or equipment. The only anesthetic was a glass of vodka. Often they amputated with a handsaw. was life. The partisan presses printed newspapers and leaflets for the people of the occupied territories. If a civilian was caught with one of them, it was a death warrant. Outside, the tide was turning. Stalingrad, the first great Soviet victory. An entire German army destroyed. Far off in the Pacific, the United States Navy was battering the Japanese. In North Africa, the British were hammering Rommel's Africa Corps. On the Volga, two German armies were being ground down by the Red Army. Partisan news was posted at the risk of life. This woman carries the lethal news hidden in the long distaff she uses for spinning wool into yarn. The word passed secretly from house to house by what seemed innocent means. The Unknown War will be back after this. The Partisans. Often the youngest were the ones most accustomed to reading. They were listened to with interest. And often it was the youngest who were the quickest observers. If they were caught, their age made no difference.
partisans, the little ones were heroes too. There were no comforts. Milk was a luxury. Bread was a treat. They didn't know what it was to have a full belly, but they knew they were loved. Occupied Polotsk, site of an orphanage. The Germans had a plan for Polotsk. Word of it came to the partisans and they acted at once. The German idea was to send the orphans to an experimental laboratory for use as human guinea pigs. The partisans evacuated the children far to the rear by the fastest means available. Valentina Ivanovna still tells the story today. Just as we boarded the plane and took off, we heard shooting. I couldn't tell how long we'd been in the air, but suddenly we landed with a thud and bumped along the ground. There were nine of us. One of the older boys, Volodya Shishkov, just about your age, jumped up and began shouting, Valentina Ivanovna, our plane is on fire. We began rescuing the children, and when some of them got out, their clothes caught on fire. I remember well how one boy's coat caught fire. It was such an old and ragged coat. And the same thing happened to a little girl. We pulled them all out and began to help the wounded partisans we had with us. When we dragged them a distance from the plane, the gas tank blew up and the whole plane caught fire. Then we wondered where the pilot was. We started looking for him. About 30 yards from the plane, we saw him. Sasha Mamkin, terribly burned all over. Mamkin's hands were burned. His face was all burned. And he was dead. But we were alive. No, we'll never forget that pilot Mamkin. Whenever I remember him, I get upset. Valentina Ivanovna's orphans were lucky. Vladimir Shubin works at a plant in Minsk. Anna Shevnova is a nurse. Anatoly Ladko is a locomotive repairman. Margarita Yetsunova went back to Polotsk, but not to the orphanage. Simon Korzhikov is chief technical officer aboard a refrigerator ship. In 1942 and early 1943, much of European Russia was occupied by the Germans, over six million of them. But the partisans were everywhere, in every republic, in every region, hundreds of thousands of them. Soviet High Command set up a central headquarters for the partisan movement. It was headed by Pantelemon Ponomarenko, a communist leader from Belarusia. Ponomarenko coordinated partisan strategy and tactics, liaised with the Red Army and delivered weapons, medicines, ammunition, explosives, doctors, food, 
sabotage experts. the Germans had to employ 15 field divisions, 10 security divisions, 27 police regiments, 144 police battalions in their efforts to handle the partisans. Two years later, 10% of all the Axis troops on the Eastern Front had been drawn into the partisan war. claimed that by July of 1943, the partisans had killed 300,000 Germans, 30 of them generals. They had destroyed over 3,000 bridges, over 1,000 tanks, nearly 500 aircraft, nearly 400 cannon, and 4,000 trucks. Unknown war will continue in a moment. The Partisans. The Germans entered the forest with caution. From time to time they mounted expeditions to comb the woods. The outcome was usually the same. The Partisans would fight, inflict casualties, and then slip away. Frustrated, the German SS burned neighboring farmsteads and the innocent old men, women, and children inside. It was enough merely to be suspected of being a partisan. command ordered the most extreme measures. To them, the lives of Russians had no value. Only unusual cruelty could terrorize the population. The means of execution the Germans believed should further the terrorizing effect. In all, the Germans killed over four million people in the Ukraine alone. In Belarusia, two and a quarter million people. And 209 cities and 9,000 villages burned to the ground. traitors, collaborators. They got their reward. A court-martial among those they had betrayed. Eventually, the partisans controlled an area as big as Holland and Denmark put together. One of their large domains was in Belarusia. 
They called it the Rudabelskaya Partisan Republic. returned pretty much to normal, or as normal as they could be when there were Germans all around them. Kids went back to school. The press is rolled again keeping up morale with news of the Red Army's latest victories. The partisan areas were safe training grounds. New groups were constantly forming. Controlled the main communication centers in force. This is Minsk, the capital of Belarus. Before they were ejected, the Nazis killed 300,000 people in the vicinity of Minsk in reprisal for acts of resistance. cities many turned into saboteurs they broke down communications disrupted production destroyed stockpiles assassinated Nazi officials feature of the local German newspapers. Wilhelm Kuba, Nazi High Commissioner of Belarus, Hitler's representative in Minsk. Their brains turn to ice with terror, Kuba had said, when they hear the name of Wilhelm Kuba. As High Commissioner, Kuba had been hangman and slave master, responsible for repressing acts of resistance, for supplying factories of Germany with a steady stream of cheap labor. One night, when Wilhelm Kuba went to bed, there was a time bomb in it. executioners were members of the Minsk underground, Osipova and Mazenik. Mazenik was Kuba's chambermaid. She planted the bomb. supplied by Pantelemon Ponomarenko, chief of the central headquarters of the partisans. Years later, he talked about it. 
This is the so-called magnetic bomb. The partisans unanimously called it queen of the bombs. At the very beginning of the war, we didn't have any. The Germans wrote in one of their works about the partisans that Mr. Ponomarenko supposedly bought from Switzerland 7,000 watch mechanisms and made time bombs with them. Actually, we sent 750,000 to the enemy rear. In that light, the mere 7,000 the Germans referred to meant nothing. The Soviet people made every one of them. And that's how those two women blew up Cuba. They put the device together one evening and set it for 24 hours later. The next day, they put it in Cuba's bed. The unknown war will continue in a moment. The Partisans. in central Russia in July 1943. The most colossal armored battle in the whole history of warfare. At Kursk, the Soviets demonstrated their undeniable military superiority over the Germans. Operations for Kursk took months. In support, central headquarters of the partisans planned massive operations that became known as the Railroad War. The partisans' mission was to deny the Germans free use of their supply routes. Both high command, Soviet and German, saw the coming battle of Kursk as critical to the entire course of the war. The Germans began to mass more troops and material than they had used in their initial invasion of Russia. The partisans were to slow down this process, then block further reinforcements and ammunition supplies once the battle was joined. The partisan operations covered 270,000 square miles. 100,000 partisans took part. losing 300 locomotives a month and over 90 miles of track despite their best efforts to keep the traffic rolling. They tried terror tactics, shooting indiscriminately. Then the partisans returned and the tracks were destroyed again. At the end of 1943, with the Red Army pressing harder and further to the west, the role of the partisans as important auxiliaries was well established. They operated on a grand scale. Grandpa Kovpak was still very much in action. By now as commander of a large force that equaled conventional units in strength and effectiveness. The commissar of the unit was Rudnov. They operated from the eastern Ukraine into the Carpathian Mountains. Senior partisan commanders held the rank of general and acted as such. The partisans' tactics changed. Their campaign of sabotage continued, but in addition, they were now strong enough to mount raids on the scale of regular military operations. 
Marching now with their own artillery, they could annihilate a garrison, liberate entire towns and villages. Everywhere they went, they heard their countrymen's accounts of German oppression. people still had to improvise. They did that very well. In their long marches, they had to ford many rivers, the Dnieper, the swamps of Pripyat. In the high passes of the south, by the side of mountain torrents across the flat plains of European Russia, among the icy forests of the north, the partisans began to claim their inheritance. More and more frequently, the Red Army and the partisan forces attacked simultaneously, the hammer and the anvil. together. The partisans had been a true army of the people, these soldiers of the forest in the night, and they had fought the people's war. After the end of the war, the partisans paraded again. It was as if a whole nation was on the march. They came from the Baltic, Moldavia, the Ukraine, Karelia, the Caucasus, the Birchwoods near Moscow, Belorussia, from cities and towns and villages from the far north to the Black Sea. had not dimmed their deeds.
Battle of the Seas. As the Nazis surged into Russia in 1941, the Soviet Baltic fleet fought on from besieged Leningrad. Far to the south, the Soviet Black Sea fleet was involved in the sieges of Odessa and Sevastopol. There, Soviet Marines fought some of the hardest battles of the unknown war. Tuesday on Biography, a profile of Germany's legendary desert fox, Erwin Rommel. Wednesday...